There are six catalysts being watched that will determine the short-term direction markets will take. One of these are the political developments in the Middle East. Joining us on the desk is Daniel Roy from Trillion Asset Management. Daniel, thanks very much for joining us. Okay, well, let's start right there. In terms of the Middle East and the bearing that it will have on us, can you give us a couple of scenarios? Well, Bronwyn, I think we've got to just go back uh, a week or so and just look at what's happened post QE3 and, and the run in the equity markets. And we, we're pretty much looking at what the catalysts are going to be going into the US election in November. And, and yes, the Middle East is one of those catalysts. Uh, we saw over the weekend the uh, assassination of the U.S. ambassador in Libya, and that's scared the markets quite a bit. We see a bit of a run in the oil prices, and I think that's going to continue. I think the, uh, the Arab Spring, which we're now moving into to winter, uh, is going to continue, and I, and I think there's a lot of uncertainty around that, and there's a bit of an underpin, I think, in oil prices uh, for, the, for the medium term. Yeah, I think, Daniel, it's, a, it's an interesting question. And, you, you know, sometimes you wonder if, if this is all engineered, you know, the, these, these things that happen in the Middle East because it just keeps the, the oil price at uh, over $100. In other words, don't bet against the <laughs> oil price at any stage. Yes. Uh, you know, d do you still think that, that the high oil price will feed into inflation locally in South Africa? Or, or? I, I definitely think that is going to be the case. I think if you look at the economic numbers that are coming through, I mean, we we set for another record uh, petrol price increase the next couple of days and I think that's going to be concerning and I think there is that underpin of inflation going to start ticking through even though interest rates are particularly low and one would think that with tool markets on, on Thursday looking to keep interest rates unchanged I think there is a concern that I think uh, oil prices are going to start to uh, really influence the South African economy and really hurt consumers. The liquidity momentum, that's mm. going to keep markets across the board buoyant. Does that mean we're set to benefit in South Africa? with the general momentum flow? Well, I think let's, let's have a look at what those, you know, we talked about the catalysts, the market catalysts uh, that, we, that we're looking at over the next couple of weeks going into November. So I think we, we're focusing a lot still on, on Spain and Greece and what's going on there. We've got some high-level meetings, the Troika are meeting on Greece in the end of September, beginning of October. We're not sure what Spain are doing, if they're going to require a bailout or not. Uh, then we've got very important U.S. earnings numbers coming out uh, at the beginning of October, third quarter numbers. So the health of the corporates is important. In very, very important. You know, let's, if we look at QE1 and 2, and hence now we've had QE3, I don't know if it's really done much for the U.S. economy. What it's done is it's driven stocks to near record you know, 2007 highs. But has it really done anything for, for the macro economy out of the United States? I'm not so sure that it has. So it will be interesting to see how those U.S. numbers come out and has the market played catch up or are, are we on the precipice of something maybe that's a little bit dangerous at the moment? So one of the th interesting things that you've, that you've been doing uh, recently, Daniel, is uh, you've, you've kind of bought into some of the turnaround stories that uh, have taken place locally. Uh, you mentioned uh, in your notes to us that, that uh, we had um, Supergroup was one of them and the other one was Metrofile. So yes. what's the kind of thinking behind buying into turnaround stories and what are the things you look for? before you, uh, you, you apply your investors' capital to those situations. It's just worth interesting for our viewers that Roger Williams also has a uh, holding in a supergroup as a turnaround story. Okay, so interestingly, you know, Metrofile is, is, comes out of quite a, quite a story because it's, it goes back a good couple of years. They, they formed part of a company called MGX which, which got into trouble and they ended up with huge amounts of debt on their balance sheet and the ability to pay that of a small little business like Metrofile uh, when I say small business, it's, it's, I think a lot, of, a lot of the investors out there will, will know the company because a lot of them use the business. So it, it dominates a very particular space in the market. It's got probably close to 85% market share. It's one of these businesses, it's like an insurance contract. You have to actually store documents for a period of time, which makes it pretty much like an insurance contract that you have to take out, that you're forced to take. And management have gone through a hell of a tough time over the last four years trying to get their business right coming out of MGX. You know, I had 400% gearing. Now you, you, know, you ask yourself, how do these businesses even survive after going through such, such a tough time? And all credit to management, because they pulled that business right, and they brought their gearing down to 40%, since from 60% last year to 40%. And it's a real cash generator. It generates a huge amount of free cash flow. And it is just a phenomenal business in the space that it operates. And being so dominant with good margins, it's, it's a great investment for us, and our clients have done very well out of it. Okay, so that, that, that was a cause for concern. Obviously, that, that massive amount of debt, when you talk about 400% uh, uh, of its value, 
Um, at what point did you decide to get in there? Because you know the cash flows from that business could easily have drowned that if, if something Absolutely. were to go wrong. So, so at what point did you make the decision that you thought it was? A, uh, I always draw the, the maxim that George Soros used to say: is never invest in a company that's going through a hard time. Invest once it's come through that hard time. So, uh, my question is: at what stage do you know that it's going to emerge before? You, you know, you play that game, which can which can also be very painful, but obviously very lucrative as well. I, I think what's very important, Warren, is to try and understand by sitting with management exactly what the game plan is going forward over the next two to three years. And, you know, sitting with management, understanding that from their perspective, there were big bullet payments that needed to be made. If they could reduce the debt, it enhances earnings dramatically over a very short period of time. And by knowing that their business is a good free cash flow generator, that they've got contracts with clients that are there three to five year type contracts. You know the cash flows are coming. It's really the deployment of cash into being able to pay down debt quite quickly and know that those earnings are then gonna filter through to the bottom line because you are able to pay down those that debt quite dramatically. Okay, so a little bit different was the case of Supergroup, which mm. you've also bought in. I mean, that share, uh, since its lows, of, I think it got to about 70 cents a share. It's, it's now turned around very handsomely for investors that bought that story. In that circumstance, a little bit different, you had a management team that changed. Correct. So you, you took out the founder and, and uh, put in a new management team. Is that very hard to ascertain uh, whether or not a new management team is going to be able to do the job. And perhaps to add to that question, what was the point at which you thought Supergroup is now, now going to turn? Yes, uh, look, it's, it becomes a bit of a subjective you know, time frame in terms of when you're going to do that. But the reality of it is we generally buy people, not necessarily businesses. So guys that have got a good track record in, in the business, in a business environment and have come through uh, tough times and have managed to pull it off, we back those type of managers and if you look what's happened both in Supergroup and in Metrofile, the, the change that, that in the, within the culture brought about a, a real focus on the business, especially within Supergroup, and they knew they had to get that business right. And uh, again, understanding what management are trying to do and backing the process and backing the management team and they've got the buy-in from staff tells me that's a good a business that we're going to buy. Right. In terms of other stock allocation out mm -hmm. there, is there anything besides Supergroup and, and Metrofile that stands out? It'd be interesting to get your point on the platinum miners. It's been a heated discussion mm -hmm. point as to whether right now we should be looking at buying into the likes of Lonman, Anglo Platinum and Impala Platinum. Bruno, I've got to tell you, we, we're very hesitant to be buying South African mining stocks generally. Um, I think that from, from our perspective, when it came to the platinum debacle, in fact, we've been doing this now for probably a year and a half to two years. We have been switching out of physical pl into uh, switching into physical platinum out of the platinum miners. Like the gold miners in South Africa, you're faced with higher input costs, higher specifically higher electricity, higher wages, where they can't really control what's going on. Plus the fact that you have to now start digging deeper than where you were digging a couple of years ago. So from our perspective, especially in platinum, we would rather buy an exchange traded note on the physical platinum than buy the platinum counters. Saying that, we would still buy the likes of a BHP Pilliton as a global diversified miner, as well as Sassel. So we, you know, we're getting the exposure, but at the moment, we like the components of, phys of physical metals being specifically platinum and gold. One of the one of the I guess you could argue one of the domestic miners that you have favoured that you've indicated is Exara. Yes. Uh, they've also embarked on, on a fairly uh, not aggressive, but they've embarked on an expansion strategy. They've spun up their Tronox, their, their uh, mineral sands businesses. Uh, what do you make of the management team and the valuation of Exara at this point? Look, you know, Exara's come down from two hundred and eleven rand. I think the high was you know just a couple of weeks ago, and we've seen we've seen the coal price drop quite dramatically, and you've seen even the junior coal miners have fallen to the wayside because of this big sell-off in terms of, of coal and obviously on iron ore on the back of it. Um, at, at this type of type of valuation, with, with Exara around about 172 Rand, I think, today, uh, it's still very, very appealing for us. And, and we like the story. So we like the coal story. It's far easier to mine coal than it is to mine platinum and to mine gold. And, and we like the management team. We like the structure. We like the way they do business. And we're very comfortable to own it. In terms of the interest rate decision due on Thursday, do you think the market is again going to be surprised or do we stay at a repo of 5%? Look, I think, I think we're going to leave rates unchanged for the moment. Uh, I think uh, Jill Marcus needs some uh, powder available to do something if necessary. Look, we, we are concerned with what's going on 
generally within the economy. And, uh, you know, I think she needs to keep some money dry just in case. Just in ter terms of that interest rate and, and something that's so sensitive is, is you mentioned that you've sold down on some of the, the uh, cash retailers mm. that you've owned, but you still continue to back uh, African Bank. Just tell us your, your thoughts on, on African Bank, which is very exposed to the credit uh, extension and, and, and unsecured lending sector of the markets. Well, I think, you know, there's been a lot of talk about unsecured lending and the bubble within, the, within that market. We believe African Bank have continued to deliver exceptional results through lots of these bubble type scenarios and through these cycles. And I think they've been able to do an unbelievable job growing their business, growing their book and managing that process, which I think is in that environment is critical. Plus, the, the uh, bringing in Ellerins and running that business more efficiently has had some spin-offs in terms of their business. And we, and we like that a lot. Just to, just to correct you though, Warren, we, we've been selling credit retailers broadly, still holding our cash retailers okay. um, with the likes of, of ShopRite and Mr. Price that we will continue to hold, even though the valuation doesn't look that compelling for Mr. Price at the moment. But uh, we still like the business, we like the business model. We've been lightening, we've held quite a big holding in Woolworths and we've been lightening that quite a bit.